she introduced her question is depressing. <laughs> she says, when she, she heard from Bhagavatam, from Srimad Bhagavatam, it is said there that souls are coming to this world like uh, as individuals, as like, and they are lonely. They like come alone to this world. And uh, she, it is also said there that like that they also live in this world by themselves alone. Live in the world? No, leave the oh, world. Oh, leave? Like yes, leave, leave the world? The world. Like, like you enter mind. alone and you yeah. leave alone. Yeah, so, and uh, during your life also you alone and you lonely. <laughs> and she says, I feel sometimes that loneliness that she says is mentioned in the Bhagavatam and uh, what, is it coming from false ego or it's like some realization how to make friends with this loneliness mm -hmm. and uh, how to live with it and how shall we see it? Well, reminds me of when Srila Prabhupada, Swami Maharaj, we know saw his pastimes, divine pastimes, and although generally Srila Gromar said in the case of an acharya, such an exalted acharya, when it was advised in terms of how to present his bi biography, he said, don't in the pre-acharya, you don't need to go into the details of that, but sometimes we're all loving, affectionate, uh, we can tell some of that, because he would say, talk about it sometimes too. So, that, uh, I would say his, and this is in his poor Vashram, before it became the worldwide Acharya Krishna Consciousness Movement, and it's in the Grihastashram, he told his wife did not uh, approve of him dedicating so much of his energy and time to Krishna consciousness. And, but his sister, we affectionately call Pishima, Baba Tarini Didi, she was uh, physically a mirror image of Prabhupada. So dealing with her was a little uh, perplexing at times, because she looked, it looked like Prabhupada and the female forms. They were that similar looking, but, and she is a devotee, very devoted. Disciple, first initiation from Saraswati Thakur, and approached Srila Guru Maharaj from Mantra Dika, second initiation. At the time, he deferred her to uh, Bhakti Sharanga Goswami Maharaj. So she is a total devotee. And she's the one who observing uh, at that time her brother Abhay Charan, his unhappy family situation. She said, Prabhu, you're meant to preach. Don't worry anymore about this family situation. You're a preacher. You just, we'll take care of that. And, and I remember hearing that, that once in Bombay, we were with Srila Prabhupada on the roof of one of the buildings there before the big place was built. And he'd walk around, like, do his walk on the rooftop because there was no park to go. And one interesting thing he said was, is then he sat and with a small group of devotees, he said to the manager there, who was Giriraj Swami, he said, are you keeping that one room available? some special room. He's like, yes, Prabhupada. But Prabhupada was asking him to keep a room for some. He never said, who? Oh, he just said, keep one room. So he's just, yes, Prabhupada. And Prabhupada said, it is for one special guest. And we're all, and, you know, but he was like, <laughs> teasing us a little bit, you know, we're all like, oh, and Prabhupada says, how he is special, I shall explain. <laughs> and then he went, <laughs> and that was 
interesting. He, he like, he said, it is for my son. Uh, and then I can't forget him saying this. He said, he's thinking to take up bhajan. So he wants to go to Sridhar Maharaj's mat. <laughs> And Prabhupada said, but I told him, I have so many, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> But that was interesting, he said, he's going to go to Sri Mars and he's going to take up Bhajan. and Prabhupada has tumbled all over the world, going, I'm going to the Chaitanya Saraswat Mountain, not with you. <laughs> but anyway, and then he said, so that's all I told him, I, you know, you can come, be with me, so keep that room for him. And then he said, I thought he would be a great devotee. When he was uh, a young boy, he said, one son, Janmastani, he was, I don't know, maybe six, seven, or young, and determined to fast till midnight. But he, as the evening wore on, he started getting weak. And Prabhupada noticed that, and he told him, he said, you know, you can take a little something. Yeah. And he said, but the boy refused. He said, no, I will fast until midnight. So Prabhupada said, I really had hopes for him. Because uh, later, this, all of this fits together when we hear him saying, and I'm paraphrasing now, but putting it this way, Srila Govinda Maharaj was the son that Prabhupada wanted to have. That's who he, he has many identities. One of them is he's the son, this is the son he wanted to have. That's why Gurudev said at the Mayapur opening, you know, like he treated me with like his, this is what he wanted, someone he could teach Gita to, who'd go out distributing back to Godhead magazines, who could preach, you know, that's the son he wanted. And not to diminish his affection for the others, but as I'm telling in this instance, he said, I had so much hope for him. And this you'll find interesting as well. He said, but he was spoiled by the communists. And he didn't mean your ancestors. <laughs> he meant the ones in Bengal. Amiya said, didn't you go to their office once? Remember? Amiya Sindhu went to their office in Calcutta. <laughs> and they've got like Lenin on the wall with like, you know, Chandan and the Malas and you know. <laughs> And it's not just something you can do. I think once when Abu Dhabi first went back to Russia, he had some portrait of Lenin on the wall and he put T-lock on it and Vijay came and said, like, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, just stop it. <laughs> stop it right now. <laughs> so, but anyway, he means the, the Bengali, you know, the little... They're supposed to be the most forward, advanced people, but like they just don't get it. Like the words out, pretty much, unless you're the supreme leader of North Korea. You know, even the Chinese wear suits. You know. <laughs> but anyway, so Prabhupada said like that, like showing that his potential, this potential was spoiled by that association. Even his son. Krishna in the Chaitanya Bhagavad, Mahaprabhu, in the Nimai Pandit, he says, and his divine madness when he takes on Varaha Bhav, he becomes the Varaha avatar at the house of Murari Gupta. He shows up one day like, <laughs> they open the door and he's like, Varaha Dave. <laughs> and he, enter, he enters the house and there's a water pitcher in the corner and he lifts it up and saves it from the Garbadak Ocean. And, 
everyone is astonished because it goes from Bhakta Bhav, here Varaha Bhav, Devi Bhav, and ultimately Radha Bhav. It's a wonderful, uh, inconceivable progression. But at that time, he's in this mood and he's telling him, he says, there's that rascal in Baranasi, in Banares, uh, Prakashananda. He's saying, he's mutilating my divine form, saying I have, he cannot see, cannot hear, cannot taste, cannot feel, describing me that way. He'll suffer for that. And he said, understand this. He said, I, my affection is for my devotees. Even my own son, because it's taken the Narak Asura, the famous Narak Asura. Why is it called Narak Asura? It's a long story that Varaha Dev and Bhumi, to read Bhagavatam Ritam, they have some divine relationship. Narak Asura is his son. Long story short, he killed him. They said, even if my own son is against devotion, finished. So, uh, this uh, aspiration so about and family, the so-called family of this world. So on that rooftop, probably one man was there at this darshan also. And Prabhupada was reflecting on his past life. And he said to that man, the man had two daughters, and this is, you know, Indian culture, Indian civilization. And he was like visibly like nervous or in anxiety. And it was related to the, his necessity to get his daughters married. So, and Prabhupada, we hear, it's in the beginning of, uh, it's in Charitamrita, it's in the Bhagavatam, echoed in the expressions of Saraswati Thakur, that the, the, what do the sadhus do? How do they show us their mercy? Sadhu, they cut attachment with what they say, the language, strongly. They cut through it by sometimes saying things that are shocking. So Prabhupada turned to this man and said, if you die, who will make the arrangements? And he was so caught off guard by it. Bhagavan! Prabhupada said, yes. He said, my, I, I, he had to make some marriage arrangements. He said, I made some arrangements for my children. He goes, my wife did not approve. And I said, therefore I said, let them all go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> the way he said it, he's like, let them all go to hell. <laughs> so he's saying these sort of responsibilities that are acquired in this world, he was prepared to meet them up to a point. So, and as we recall recently, we sing that song every day. Pranamam Ishada Prabhupada Padam. Janaka Dikabhat Saloshnikta Padam. What's the first part? Uh, Kripaya Hari Kirtana Murti Dharam Dharani Taraharaka Gora Janam Janaka Dikabhat Saloshnikta Padam. Pranamam Ishada Prabhupada Padam. The Lord said that. Saraswati Thakur, he had the sweetness of Vrindavan with him, and it could only be detected with him. Externally, he was in the form of a devastator. So sometimes we associate some rather fierce imagery with him. Singha Guru. But he said he had the sweetness of Vrindavan within, and then the slogan we're saying, Kripaya Hari Kirtan Murti. He's always by his engaged in Hari Kirtan Krishna Kata, who did not sing and dance visibly. His every movement was like 
beautiful dance, and everything that ever came out of his mouth was kirtan. And Guru Maharaj says here, and it parallels what he's written elsewhere in slokas, he said, he's revealing on the one hand that the so-called affection of this world, between man and woman, or family, and that, it's all a hoax, it's, what is the, you know, uh, deception, friendship, mundane friend, is deception, all of these things. And that person has revealed this with this strong cutting language, Janaka Dikabatsal Padam. He's more affectionate than, a fa than your fa own father. So how to harmonize these seeming uh, disparate uh, point of view. So Srila Prabhupada Swamiraj, when he's in Vrindavan, remember, he had some success as a businessman in household life, but then that went down. Some people say, because of his, him and Guru Maharaj always talking about Krishna and Mahaprabhu and that his business was neglected, just as they told, uh, historically they said, when Pratapurudra Maharaj came under the influence of Mahaprabhu, that was the end of the Arisan Empire. Lost the military spirit, couldn't fight anymore, you know, like, was, you know, what's the word, emasculated. <laughs> this stuff goes on all the time. Right? And, and what I'm getting at is who are our real friends? Actually, we have real friends and an inconceivable amount of real friends. But just, to, and I'll get to that in a moment. But so here, so Prabhupada's in Vrindavan, and now, following the advice of his sister and his own internal inspiration, and Saraswati Thakur were appearing to him in dreams. He said once in Los Angeles, he said, My Guru Maharaj, after his disappearance, started appearing to me in dream and saying, Come out, come out. He went, Come out of household life and take sannyas. And Prabhupada said, At the time, I thought, Ooh. Horrible. Not horrible, but horrible. <laughs> Ooh, how horrible. <laughs> He's even saying that, who generally, you know, presented himself as what he was, a perfect disciple. I only ask my guru as one question, how can I serve you? And Prabhupada could talk the talk and walk that divine walk of being the ultimate servitor who gave every, put his life on the altar of self-sacrifice in service of the order of Saraswati Thakur, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, Mahaprabhu, like that. But sometimes he'd give little glimpses of times where things were not so perfect. But still, he said, it's Guru Maharaj appearing to them, then the sister giving some inspiration, others, many things. Then he took uh, Vanaprastha, ultimately sannyas, he's living in Vrindavan. He said, but now that he had no money, <laughs> he said, the, fam all, the, the whole, that big colossal hoax of a family arrangement, especially in India, you ever hear of the joint family system? When we would go preaching to these villages, in every village there's some millionaire who's reputed to be a devotee, and they'd always put you up at their house, and it's always like first ground floor, first floor, second floor, third floor, you know. And we'd be on a floor that's totally unoccupied, and you know, like say fourth floor or something. You go, well, what is this for? Oh, that is for son number three. His he and his family will live there. So on this floor, another son and his. That's when this big Kutamba Baraninava, in the words of Sukadeva Goswami, <laughs> big arrangement. They like it, that ever expanding uh, family arrangement. But Prabhupada, that suddenly, everyone who was so concerned before, now that he was penniless, he wrote, he said, The only thing that remains of my family life is like a long list of names. <laughs> and then he wrote a postcard to Srila Guru Maharaj and he said, I 
think in my present position that the animals and the trees and the plants, they're more friendly to me than human beings. I feel a sense of camaraderie with them. <laughs> no longer with human beings. So that's a, that's a mood that comes because all of this is a hoax, all of these other arrangements to deal with loneliness or finding your counterpart, your soulmate. Because who, what we're searching for, sometimes I mention this in my preaching in Russia in the secular setting, that we have all these things now like social networks, you know, matchmaker.com, so, when you go to one of these sites, the idea is you should put in your ideal criteria for who your mate will be. You know, they will look like this, they will like to do this, you know. And, you know, long walks on the beach. <laughs> for some reason, people in America, they always say, long walks on the beach. <laughs> Even if it's the Vaitarini River. <clears throat> That's a very esoteric. You know, but, uh, so, they're putting ideal criteria, right? but as I put, mentioned as a footnote, from a scientific point of view, nobody writes in there, you know, carbon-based life form, seeking relationship, intimate relationship, with other carbon-based life forms. <laughs> That would be absurd, but that's another subject. But still, this idea, ideal criteria, and I'm here to suggest that here we shall equate the ideal with the absolute. The ultimate ideal is the absolute. And anyone less than the absolute ideal is incapable of reciprocating ideal criteria. So that's why when people enter a relationship to, to uh, address that loneliness, we're using that word this evening, uh, they find out in time, really, they're projecting ideals onto someone who's admittedly less than ideal. They're not the absolute. And in time, they begin to, like a checklist, they say, whoop, you know, nope. Nope, nope, nope. <laughs> and then they realize, it's like in the T.S. Eliot poem, uh, Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, where uh, there's a line where he says, what after all this entreaty and submitting and all these things, what if the girl turns and says, that's not what I was thinking at all. That's not what I was thinking at all. And you realize it's only your own fantasy being imposed on another person. So gradually you realize they're not ideal, so then that relationship ends in frustration, disappointment, dissolution. So what I am suggesting is the absolute is capable of reciprocating these ideals. There's a very beautiful line <clears throat> that Srila Guru Maharaj quotes sometimes from the, from Srimati Radharani herself, where she says, Prati Anga Lage Kande Prati Anga Mor. Who is Krishna? He is that person who is capable of satisfying and correspondingly every atom of my soul's hankering to address every atom of its hankering. And not only for one, but the absolute means of satisfying all must necessarily be. Right? Not one person or a few, two or a few, but everyone. The absolute has that capacity to reciprocate. That's really the meaning of Akila Rasamrita Murti. So now on this loneliness issue, we can say, Bhagavatam says, 
Sudurlaba Bhagavata Hiloke. Such personalities who personify this type of love and affection and can extend it to you, they're very rare to find in this world. But Guru Maharaj takes it a step further, he's saying, yes, they're very rare in this world, but there's another world of which they are, they constitute the entire population. Everyone in that world is like that. And not only that, not only every person there is like that, everything there is like that. By Kuntir Priti Vyari Sokala Chinmoy. The soil is your friend. The soil has your interest at heart. The trees have your interest at heart. Every bird, every insect, everything, the wind, the air, the rivers, the streams, everything is your best friend, has your self-interest at heart. So these devotees who are sometimes described very exclusively, right, they're recluse, they're exclusive, they're not mixing so much in ordinary society, but they're not lonely. They're, they're connect, the Krishna conception is elaborate. Right? Guru Maharaj used to quote it's, we see his humility. He, so many times he's quoting devotees who said th something at the mat, he heard them say. It made some impression upon him. His heart is so soft and beautiful and melted. Heard something said by some relative newcomer to Krishna consciousness and he never forgot that. And he peppered his lectures with some of these things. So he remembered, and this is probably from like 1973, where at some meeting, some lady was asked to speak, some disciple, Srila Prabhupada Swami Maharaj, and she said what she liked about Krishna consciousness is we're being given an opportunity to have a family life with Krishna. Guru Maharaj never forgot that. He thought that was just so wonderful of her to say that. And he quoted it repeatedly so many times. And also, he is commending her for appreciating that, that what you want, that can be addressed in Krishna conception. So, it does appear from an external point of view that these devotees are, uh, we could even say, you know, lonely or isolated. Actually, they have more friends than, than you can possibly imagine. They're connected in a real and substantial way with spiritual personalities in the upper world. Right? Uh, so, uh, here, we, how can we expect to have really address the, these loving necessity, necessity for fulfillment, etc., and loving exchange, if we don't properly conceive ourselves, we have a misconception about who we are, what our identity is, and all of those of whom we're in connection with. Now, I remember, of course, my mom won't see this video. <laughs> so, I remember, and it probably happens to every kid, or many, when you're like at the age of puberty or something, but I remember being around 13 and, and like in the kitchen, my mother is at the sink doing something and talking to me, but we're both not looking at each other. And it occurred to me, I thought, this woman thinks she knows who I am, but actually we really don't know who we are, but just on the basis of some assumed relation. She's talking and as if she knows who I am, I'm talking to her like I know who she is. But actually, we have no idea who we are, each of us. And then when she turned around, I looked at her and for a moment, I went, whoa, you know, like, for a moment, she looked like a total stranger to me. So you can say, oh, it's, you know, some phase you're going through, whatever. But it's like a realistic phase. I remember once my, my, a girlfriend of my brother was uh, 
talking to me and, ha and asking, about, who am I, where have I come, asking philosophical questions. And my brother said, she's going through a phase. <laughs> I said, she's going through a good phase. You should be asking, who are you, where have I, you know, <laughs> she's going, she'll get over it. <laughs> so, it, it's a precarious situation for devotees who have some family connection, etc. Because, uh, you know, you, you can't be callous and sensitive, but at the same time, You've got this philosophical understanding working in the background. So that's why I meant to say by injecting earlier that Srila Prabhupada, as an example here, ultimately was not sentimental. What he had hoped for one son, he saw realized in Srila Govinda Maharaj. So, uh, when at the time of giving Harinam, after giving a talk about the ten offenses and then usually the four types of Nama Bas, also to avoid that, and Srila Guru Mars would say, uh, you know, go in the Nat Mandir, take four rounds and then take prasadam. But he would always say this wherever your god brothers and god sisters are, give your dandavats to them. He's saying, because you're being welcomed into the family of Krishna. So, and that is sometimes described as achuta gotra. Like gotra means a family line. And there's a mundane idea of what is achuta gotra, meaning it's like you could translate it as God's family. And people who think that through some sort of blood lineage, they have a right to be connected to that, but that's not what we're talking about. But when you become accepted in Krishna consciousness by substantial Vaishnava agency, then you're part of a family that is infinitely larger than you could possibly conceive, and you'll realize that in time. So that the devotees, they don't feel alone. They feel some real connection with uh, all of those who are in connection with Krishna consciousness. I remember at the end of one uh, darshan, I brought some ISKCON leaders to hear from Srila Guru Maharaj. And at the end, one said, he's overwhelmed. And, uh, well, I should say before that, actually, we went downstairs to take prasadam. Srila Gurudev gave everyone prasadam. And then he said something very uh, peculiar. He said, Guru Maharaj uh, wants some of this prasadam that you're taking and wants you to come back upstairs and see him again. And we thought, that was, on, you know, after an hour and a half darshan. Anyway, we went back upstairs and Srila Guru Maharaj said, I am thinking, it, I got the inspiration that your uh, sincerity for preaching Mahaprabhu's Krishna conception is so great that Mahaprabhu himself supplied this prasadam. So I asked Govinda Maharaj to bring some to me. And we're, he said a few more things and then that, the Buddha, he said, well, Thank you, thank you so much, thank you. And Guru Maharaj went, thank you? <laughs> he said, that doesn't sit well with me. And then he's like, well, what should we say? <laughs> uh, and Guru Maharaj said, well, express some appreciation. He said, but, he said, thank you presupposes two parties. But there's this one party, you come in connection with another party, you get something for them, thank you for that, and then you go. And then Gaurav said, very he turned his head and his arm, he said, but we are all Mahaprabhu's men. 
And I, at the time, I thought, I said, he who's so exalted, he, he, when he says we, he's including us in his we. We are all Mahavirus. And then at the time I thought, because it's un other unfortunate, and those who are in a lower position, they're not willing to include him in their we. How unfortunate and how sad that is. But he, happy, he who is so exalted, when he says we, he's including us. So we're happy uh, to be included in that we. And so we don't feel lonely because we have Guru Vaisnava, the God brother, God sister, the great devotees, Sadhu Shastra, who've lived before. We feel something living. It's not nostalgia, it's not imagination, it's not poetry. You read something written by a great devotee, like in Prapana Jivanamrita, but it could be Bhagavatam. Charitamritam, elsewhere, and you can dance with that and realize, oh, that great soul, I have some connection with them by appreciating the devotional sentiments being expressed from their hearts, and it's real. You think, how fortunate we are. We can read, you know, the uh, Vishwanath Chakrabarti Thakur's comments on the Bhagavatam, and you can feel his association. He's so great, so wonderful, and we can connect with him by the grace of our Guru Varga. So many these personalities. Uh, so, we're even alone, we can have a festival. <laughs> Sometimes we're alone, we're having festivals. <laughs> <laughs> really, we're thinking, this is like a feast. Anangotsavam. Jayade says, what? Uh, in his description. Vishve shamana ranjanena janayan anam nam indivara shreni shamal kamalair panayan anangotsavam. It's describing the form of Krishna's hands. It's a festival. Krishna looks like a festival, a walking, moving festival for the eyes, everything. So Guru Maharaj, when we were uh, Guru Dev, when we were in Sokal, and uh, <laughs> Hasha Priya Prabhu was presenting the the first honey gathered from the beehives. They're doing like beekeeping for a while. I, I was the one. All right, so you're right. All right, you know. I was the beekeeper. Right. Okay, there you go. And he's got, you know, the marks to prove it. <laughs> so, the bee stings. And anyway, so he's coming and giving, and Gurudev suddenly goes like, oh, I'm feeling a little sad, Prabhu. And they're thinking, why? You know, it's a celebration, honey, it's wonderful. And Gurudev said, no, but Guru Omar didn't say it's like that. And we're thinking, what? And his favorite sloka, which is in the end of uh, Prapana Jivanamrita, the one that says, Sri Srimad Bhagavad Padam Buddha, uh, Swadotsavai Shat Padai. Shat Padai means six uh, legs. It's, an, it's a Sanskrit way of saying bees. So there it said, the, the devotees, they're like bees, and they're relishing the honey of talking about Krishna, discussing Krishna, Majjita, Madgata, Prana, Bodhayanta, Paraspadam, Tushyanti, Charama. It's like uh, eating, like a, a, consuming a feast. So he said, while they're relishing this nectar, it's making them mad, and some of the drops are falling from their, their you know, like that, madly tasting the nectar, and drops of that nectar are falling from their lotus mouths, and Guru Maharaj said, I'm collecting that. And what I've captured from them, I've presented here in this Prapana Jivanamritam. And this is life giving nectar for the surrendered souls. So Guru Dev was saying, that's the way it should be. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, another, he feels, and we shall follow in his footsteps and feelings, some living connection with the devotees. It's not our imagination, it's not a fantasy. It's real and it's the substance of Krishna consciousness. That's a type of sadhu sangha. And when we're in their association, the loneliness will be a, a, an abstract memory. And without them, you're alone. Even if you're surrounded by a joint family, uh, you know, if you're at the Kumbha Mela, you'll be alone. <laughs> Hare Krishna.